Je vous parle d'un temps que les plus de 25 ans ne peuvent pas connaître. Uh, yes, we are going to talk about the generation Z, uh, people who always know Internet. Uh, who can coach and how can we coach this generation? So answer with Daniel Good, is director of the Institute for the Study of Youth Sport. Can you hear us? Yes, thank you Perfectly. very much. It's your turn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here and talk to you today. Uh, my apologies to the organizers. Uh, first, I was thrilled to be asked to present at the conference and then disappointed. Um, my university has a travel ban on, so I had to cancel my flight and, uh, and couldn't come. So uh, actually, it's fitting I'm talking about Generation Z and their affinity towards technology. So I'll be presenting uh, from a technological afar. So if we look at the next slide, uh, where the idea for this study came, it actually came directly from a coach. Uh, uh, this is on the left, Martin Blackman. If you're from tennis, you'd probably know him. He's the head of the U.S. Tennis Association Player Development Division, and he's a great coach. Um, and I was talking to him uh, three or four years ago, uh, just a general conversation, and he was telling me that he really liked his players and he's passionate about coaching, but he, he gets frustrated sometimes. And I remember he's saying that they don't seem to take the opportunities like I would have if I had all these opportunities uh, when I was young. They don't seem to do that as much anymore. And as we talk more, it, it wasn't like a, a complaining session on his part. He was just saying, I'm trying to adapt to this generation of players meet them where they are and help them develop, uh, but they're different in some ways. And that really made me think, and I go, well, okay, that's Martin's perspective and I really respect him, but what do other coaches think? So if we look at the next slide, um, I, I first went before even thinking about what other coaches think, I said, what's the general literature? Um, so there's some literature in the field of psychology and some other fields, higher education, um, that look at what they call cohort groups. So we have the baby boomers, uh, we have millennials, now we have Generation Z and we'll have a new group coming after. And these are large classes of people in certain age ranges and they share certain characteristics. Like many, many years ago, they went through the depression or they went, they experienced 9-11. So major societal uh, and economic changes affect each de generation differently and shapes them to some degree. Generation Z is born after 1996. Some articles say 95. Um, if we take the birth years 95 to present in our country, there's about 74 million individuals would fall in the Gen Z bracket and 2 billion uh, worldwide would be the estimate. So we're talking about a lot of young people. What's so unique about this generation, it's the first generation to have grown up in a totally digital world. So they've only known technology uh, since day one. They probably had their picture taken, um, you know, with a, an Apple phone or one of Samsung phone and, and played with toys that are digital and people feel that has shaped them greatly. So if we look at the next slide, the general research, again, not tied to sport, but looking at this generation in general, has revealed that they're the best educated uh, generation ever. They're highly motivated to succeed. They really wanna do well. They have excellent technology skills. Uh, however, they also have uh, some maybe not positive attributes, short at shorter attention spans. Uh, people think that might be related to technology and the, the changing environment. Uh, in the literature, they talk about a need for structure and boundaries because they were brought up in, at least in our country and, and in North America, I think in general, parents are involved in their children's life and the kids don't do as much free play. So they're used to very being structured, have boundaries. So then they sort of expect that and need that as they get older. They lack strong interpersonal skills. A lot of times they're good at texting each other, but one-on-one -on -one conversations aren't as good. 
They really want to be involved in decision making. And as we just heard, uh, of all the generations, they report the most stress and the highest incidence of mental illness. That might be because it's more acceptable to present, to admit to those things now. But it also probably is a result of what's going on in society. There might be more stress, et cetera. Next, please. So the questions we were interested in, or I, myself and my research team, are, okay, we know these general characteristics. The athletes have the similar ones. So what are and how do the characteristics of Gen Z athletes influence their coaching practice? So if I'm a coach, what does that mean for me? So that's what we'll focus on today. So if we look at our next slide, we ended up doing two research studies on this topic. One was published last year uh, for the researchers in the group. It's in the Journal of Applied Sports Psychology, where we uh, followed up uh, with interviewing uh, in-depth interviews with 12 U.S. Tennis Association coaches. They're all in the player development division. They work with some of the best young players anywhere from 14 on up. Um, these interviews typically were over an hour long and we we asked them about Gen Z and asked them about their coaches. Then we content analyzed that. Now that was published. We found some things that I'll share with you in a minute. But we were also said, well, how does this is this some of this tennis specific? It's an individual sport. What about other sports? So we're just finishing a study now. We're just finishing analyzing the data where we did interviews with 12 division one, the highest division of the NCAA, National Collegiate Athletic Association, coaches in different sports. And then we also said, let's get the athletes perspective. So we did interviews with 18 athletes um, there. And again, in-depth interviews that we content analyze. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. I've kind of mixed the results of both studies here because I really wanna focus on the implications. So if we look at the next slide, the questions that we were interested in are, in are, what are the characteristics of today's Generation Z athlete? The second bullet point, how do Gen Z athletes differ from previous generations of athletes? And third, and what I'll focus on the most today, what coaching strategies are effective with Gen Z athletes? And again, this is the coach's perception of what's effective. Uh, with their athletes. Next. So let's talk about some of our results. In, in the dark print here, you see lack of independence and visual learners. What we do in these studies is we take the interviews, we transcribe them exactly as what was said, and then we content analyze. So we go through and identify uh, meaning units, I'll call them. That is a, a, a phrase or a paraphrase that contains one thought or one idea. So then we get, you know, a large number of these meaning units, let's for sake of example, 100 meaning units, and we go through and we try to put similar ones into like categories so we could have more uh, general dimensions of what was said. So when we look at our results relative to athlete characteristics, we found like one category was lack of independence we heard coaches talk about. And in the red, you see a quote from one of the coaches. I think a dependence on me to solve their problems. You know, you miss a shot or you're, you're winning and all of a sudden you start losing. They're looking to the sideline. They're looking uh, for help. This was a tennis coach. Other quotes like this all related to a lack of independence as a characteristic of this generation. Another characteristic uh, category was visual learners. And you see a quote that typifies the, the meaning units that made this up. They have the ability to look at a video for themselves or other players and really draw a lot of information. They're pretty astute and they're pretty complex in their ability to interpret through video. It was interesting when we debriefed uh, the results of our studies with all the uh, USTA uh, player development coaches, they all are using uh, iPads and other things to give immediate visual feedback to their players on the court. 
So I think they're adapting to that characteristic. If we look at the next two categories, want to know why. As this uh, quote typifies, they have a more critical, in some ways, view of things, or at least they're asking why this coach says. And I think you need to explain to Gen Z why we're doing this. What's the purpose of this? We heard repeatedly from coaches that Gen Z was very interested in, you know, they're not going to listen to you because you're just because you're a coach. They're going to listen to you if you give them a rationale on why you're doing what you're doing. Sensitive to ne negative feedback and this, I could label this almost hypersensitive to negative feedback. Coaches said things like you see here. I do not think they, I do think they struggle with negative feedback. I think they take it personal. I think they, again, tie it to their self-worth. So a lot of the coaches were telling us that if, if, if you really criticize a player, um, they really take it personally, they shut down. Uh, they said they have had to change their coaching to adapt to this that we'll see in a few minutes. Let's look at the next slide. Shorter attention spans, which parallels the previous general literature that we talked about. Uh, Paying attention for them is a struggle sometimes, this coach says. Their attention span is short. I think it's shorter than it has been in the past. And we repeatedly heard this from coaches. And incidentally, as a university professor, we hear as well that students have trouble focusing for the whole hour and you have to divide your lectures up into smaller bits. Apparently, this is also happening on the court. Uh, as was just said in the previous presentation uh, from Tanya, this generation struggles a lot with adversity in general, but our coaches felt that was the case on the court. This was a very big category we found. As this coach says, I don't believe that when they're faced with adversity, which I would say, you know, sports is a loss or failure of some type. I don't think that's particularly well, that they're particularly well prepared and have good coping mechanisms. So they struggle a lot when they're faced with failure or adversity, and it's something the coaches said they have to be prepared for. Next, lack of strong interpersonal skills. Again, they're highly, highly focused on technology. And this coach says, in my experience with these players, they're just general social skills, like introducing yourself to someone new or being able to strike up a conversation is not, they're not as good at it because they're busy texting or doing other things on their phones. Other category here I have is need social media and phone. This coach says the social media piece is two things. I think one is they're addicted to it. I think that's one. But I think two is that now it's now become the language of caring for them. And we'll talk about this more when I get into strategies in a minute. Next. So what are the characteristics? I haven't given them all, but I tried to highlight some of the larger categories uh, today. What do the characteristics of Gen Z athletes mean for your coaching? What does it mean for your one on one and your group work with your athletes? Let's look at that. Next, please. Here's a category. So again, the dark printer categories and under it, I have like specific examples. We repeatedly heard from the coaches, you have to build relationships. Now this is nothing new. We probably hear this back, you know, at the first Olympics with the Greeks uh, um, in Olympia that you, know, you need to build a relationship with your athlete. But it, it's, it's different now, they said, that you don't automatically get trust uh, because you're the coach. Um, they check on the, if you tell them something in practice, they go YouTube it later to see if they find additional information if you're correct. The coaches repeatedly told us you must build relationships with those athletes and they do it through weekly talks and combined with encouraging them, which we'll talk about in a minute, build trust by regular interaction. So they said they're very, uh, and going back to Chris's talk, they're very explicit in doing this. Next, individualized and customized coaching. Um, the coaches said they spend more time on individual coaching, even team sport athletes. Like uh, we interviewed one coach in the sport of baseball 
uh, who said that I have a lot more position groupings and we do a lot more uh, small group. And this goes to other coaches talked about customized groups, adapting to those athletes. A fourth one is interesting. Make sure the athletes are OK with being reprimanded in front of the team. Um, it goes back to being sort of hypersensitive to critical feedback. Um, this coach said you just don't want to be doing it unless you know that athletes comfortable with you doing that. Uh, weekly meetings again, a lot of small groups. Let's go to the next. I encouragement motivation. Um, a, a lot of uh, thoughts made up this category, but they were all focused on being positive, encouraging, kind of motivating them. Uh, as one coach said, remind them they're great. Dish out more praise. Uh, one coach said use the, he uses the sandwich approach where you say something positive, you give them the technical instruction and you say something positive. Um, try to be as upbeat as possible. Focus on the good. This coach says they will check out if it's negative. OK, let's go to our next category on the next slide. Uh, manage technology and social media. Uh, we repeatedly heard uh, email is ineffective. Ironically, like at universities, we usually email people, but most of the young people text or use other social media platforms. Uh, you know, a lot of coaches said I need to come in and have rules about their use of their smartphones. Um, you know, whether it's cell phone limits. Uh, now that's easier said than done. There's some research that if you take a young person's phone away, it causes anxiety because they feel they're out of touch. Um, you know, so the whole phone piece is very interesting. Uh, one coach said teach to talk, not text. Uh, no phones during meals is another strategy a coach use uh, during team meals. Uh, and another said, whatever you do, don't send critical feedback over the phone. Let's look at our next. Set boundaries and provide structure. Um, again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about um, some young people in this generation are used to having a lot of structure from from sort of birth on upward. They're used to having uh, people organize things for them. So the coaches said you need to have pretty organized practices, work hard to structure practices, spell out expectations very explicitly. Um, and one coach said completely structure practices. Next. Teach emotional control and coping skills was another major category of uh, coaching strategies. Uh, a coach said teach to stop letting emotions carry the day in that he'd see his athletes. Sometimes uh, their emotions would sort of overtake them. Teach when emotions are appropriate. Um, this coach talked about it's very important that athletes sport is emotional. That's one of the great things about sport, but when you should have certain emotions when you should not teach how to deal with adversity. Focus on the process, not just wins and losses, um, which again, we have a lot of literature in sports psych, which uh, supports that, but the coaches are seeing this is critical. We look at the next one. Let's talk. Those were the general categories, and I'm going to just finish with some sp more specific examples and some quotes. Um, of that came from individual coaches. This coach was talking about giving instruction when uh, giving negative feedback. And this coach said they, the athletes, seem to handle it fine, especially when you're presenting this and how you can do it better. So you're maybe criticizing them, but you're telling them how they can actually do it. So the whole idea of just reprimanding an athlete or criticizing an athlete without tying it to specific instruction We've won good coaching, but coaches get frustrated. We just heard that and they may not do that. It's going to be ineffective, especially with this generation. If we look at the next example. Have rules pertaining to cell phone use. They need to create certain parameters where, you know, you can't use a phone during practice. Now, when I take them to tournaments, I take the phone away an hour before, you know, I take the phone away at night because they can become quite challenging. We have uh, data that shows that a lot of young people don't get enough sleep. They're up on social media late. 
I have actually a former elite figure skater as a, 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 a master student now. And she's studying how social media use influences high level athletes um, because you can't control what's said about you. So, you know, again, this is easier said than done. Um, our gymnastics team, some of the athletes were telling us to coach kind of followed recommendations like this, took the phones away. But then they, they said, we feel so isolated. That's almost like how we talk to each other now. So really thinking this out, I think, is important and not just a simple rule. If we use the next example depicted on the next slide, when presenting information, keep it short, ask a lot of questions and have players reflect on why. This coach said, I think you want to just, you know, still make your point. What's the purpose of a drill is and so on. But the feedback has to be quick and to the point and then move on. We, uh, in terms of the pedagogy of teaching, we heard this over and over. You've got to be quick. You've got to be organized. As Chris was talking about, you need to be explicit, get it in and out because you're not going to hold their attention. Next. Build resiliency through stressful situations. Uh, in practices, come up with ways that they're going to be uncomfortable and you make them get through it. And so, you know, unless you teach them, that they get confidence from that, they're not going to deal with the adversity very well. So ironically, if we take uh, Chris's and Tanya's presentation, Chris talked about the need to be explicit. So to me, that's really important here. We want to teach coaches, expl athletes explicit skills for managing their emotions. So Tanya uh, uh, mentioned uh, mindfulness or relaxation. So we have them practice that. Then we create stress and practice and have them adapt in that situation. So uh, I think it's very important here. We don't want to like if I use a swimming example, we don't throw kids in the deep end of the pool to, to see if they swim or sink. We give them some lessons on how to float other things. Then we bring them into deeper water. So here I think it's absolutely essential we build resiliency through stressful situations, but we have to be very smart about it. Next, build independence by giving players responsibilities. Uh, in the United States anyways, we see a lot of our college athletes come and their players and coaches have done everything for them. And they get to college and they're sort of on their own and they really struggle some. So this coach said the more you give players, players of this generation, the more you give them input, the more you give them a voice and allow them to kind of create and design their own schedules, the more independent they become. So again, trying to explicitly help them become more independent. And part of that is they don't want to just be told what to do. They need to feel like it's part of their idea. So by asking questions, getting them involved, we can do that. If we look at the next slide which ties into what I just said, use open-ended questions to facilitate feedback. Um, Sir John Whitmore from Britain, a former uh, coach and then corporate consultant, wrote his uh, coaching book in the GROW model. If you haven't read that, I uh, recommend it. And it's all about the importance of asking questions versus telling. As coaches, we're very good at telling, but the learner will learn better sometimes if they come up with the answer, if they discover it. And this coach in this quote has learned that. The question part of it's so important because when you do get in the habit of asking them questions, you kind of facilitate that feedback and then it becomes much easier to pick up on how the player's feeling. So he's talking about another advantage we could get from asking questions. If we look at our next slide, purposely teach interpersonal skills, uh, this coach says, I taught them to to go up and introduce themselves, you know, good morning. And when you see somebody, thank you when the practice is done, you know, that's like a constant, constant thing that I just tried to build general social skills. And as the athlete becomes more elite, you know, good social skills are going to help you get uh, sponsors better, interact with outside people, et cetera. Next slide. So. That was very quick, I know, but I promised to try to stay in a 25 minute window here. Hopefully I've accomplished that. Um, but what I've tried to do today is talk a little bit about Gen Z in general. 
then tie it to what coaches perceive are the characteristics of Gen Z athletes. So we talked about those shorter attention spans, et cetera. Then we talked about strategies that coaches perceive that they are effective for them to use with their athletes. So the point, I'd, if you're a coach in the room that I, I kind of challenge you with here, what are two strategies you can take home and implement with your athletes in the upcoming season or if you're in season now, now from what I talked about? Just two. Um, I think it's very important for us to kind of take sort of this academic stuff and turn it into practice. Now, the other thing I hope that a lot of the things I've talked about resonate with your experience. And I know myself and coaches I've talked with when we go to conferences like this, a lot of what you hear is not new. It, to me, it reinforces what I've been doing. OK, I'm on the right track. I'm doing the right things. There's a few things that I go, oh, I'm not sure I buy that. I may disagree. Sometimes I, I never change my opinion. Other times it sinks in and I start experimenting and I change. And a few things are really cool that I'll kind of take and, and follow up on. So try to think about that today. What, what does this research in general, what does coaching Gen Z look like? How does it affect me? Uh, and how does it affect my coaching? Uh, one thing we see in the United States since uh, Larry Nasser, terrible things that happened with gymnastics, a lot of the coaches say in our country they need to. On one hand, this is a really good thing. They need to be very careful with their coaching. You never know when somebody has a phone on and recording you and you never know um, when you're being videoed. And that can come back and really haunt you if you say something you regret later. So the good part of that is I think coaches should always be thinking everything I say would be public and I wouldn't be embarrassed to have it in the public. And on the other hand, it, it puts more pressure on coaches because you have very little latitude to have a bad day or be tired and say something you might regret. If we look at the next slide, we'll come to our conclusions. Generation Z athletes are different, but also the same. If we look at something called self-determination theory, where almost all people want to feel competent, they want relatedness, they want some autonomy. Gen Z athletes are like that, but how they get relatedness might be from social media likes. Then maybe our generation, it was people giving you compliments. Every generation has some positive and negative characteristics. So I don't want this to be bashing Gen Z. They have some great characteristics, more accepting of diversity. They're motivated to do really good things. OK, but they also have some characteristics that are, are trickier. The, a point for me is we need to find a balance between challenging them and meeting when they are. So for attention span. OK, I, I'll use it as a university professor, but it's similar to a coach. They have trouble focusing for the whole hour where 20 years ago they did a better job of that. So I could divide my class up in 15 minute chunks and then a little break, 15 break. The trouble is not everything can be presented in 15 minute chunks. So how do I sort of work through this? Well, I probably need to meet them where they are and not just give them hour lectures with no breaks. But over time, I try to increase their attention span. You need to do that in coaching. Next slide. I also want to emphasize these are very general trends. There, there's vast individual differences. We always know there's more differences within a generational group than between them. That being said, you know, there are some general patterns that I think really behoove us to think about. Second bullet point, you still need to get the athlete to the same place, but the way you get them there is quite different. Um, and we need to think through that. And how do we adapt to the new generation and capitalize on their strengths while facilitating, and I should left a word out here, while facilitating the, uh, an improvement in their weaknesses, not facilitate their weaknesses. Next, please. So let me stop there, merci beaucoup. Uh, again, I regret I can't be there live with you. I was so disappointed after the um, I, I saw the Tokyo games and right at the end of closing ceremonies, they talked about Paris and all the excitement. And I was just so excited to visit you and learn from you. But and that's COVID and we all have to adapt. So um, I hope you enjoyed this and I'd be glad to answer any questions.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Is there any questions? Is there any questions? No? Daniel, you were perfectly clear. So thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for your job. I think thanks to you, I can understand better my teammates. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> See you. See you in Paris. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.